There they are. Let's take them out. Is your body ready? It better be if you want to take on the final stage of Sin and Punishment Star Successor. By fusing with Kachi, uh, Issa's body has turned into that, and it has multiplied his total health by 10, bringing it up to 1,000. Matching it is the general destructive ability of your shots, although the mechanics of the, of the charge shot have not changed, even though you're now fused with Kachi. Uh, unfortunately, you are in space taking on the Big Bad Mothership and the entire army of Nebulox at once. So despite the fact that your health bar appears to be much larger and you've got a thousand total health, uh, all the damage has been multiplied by 10 as well. So there's effectively no change to the mechanics of the game, other than you better be dodging pretty much non-stop because the bullets are going to be flying non-stop. Now this isn't actually a boss, it's more of a mini-boss, and it's really freaking hard, even on a good day. So you need to uh, destroy all of these laser emitters while they're emitting lasers that are bouncing off this ring of mirrors. It's kind of like the first boss in uh, Gradius V, except that there's no way to get those lasers off the screen, unlike the rings from uh, the first Gradius V boss. And, uh, destroying the emitters does not actually lower the number of lasers on screen. It just makes multiple lasers come out of the same emitter. It is just incredibly hard to keep track of the emitters and keep your uh, cursor over the emitters and also dodge all of these lasers, especially when a lot of the safe spots you need to dodge into are so tiny. But... With a quarter of our health remaining, we're through it. And uh, now we finally get to go and take on the first real boss. Well, just about. First, we gotta deal with some homing bullets. Taking out these eyeballs opens up the corridor of death, where we will take on the first boss the N5 Energy Diffuser. So, we are confined to this corridor, and there are a lot of, uh, you know, lightning bolts to dodge. The target is actually just completely in the center. You're firing straight into this thing. You can't see the target ever. And also missiles are being fired at you that you can bat back, but they're kind of hard to see because of all the energy beams and the corridor you're going down. This boss is actually a lot more challenging than you might think. Once again, got through by the skin of our teeth, and rewarded with at least a smaller health pickup. Aside from uh, some strafing lasers, it's mainly going to be bullets and homing bullets here, and lots of them. You can pick up a medal for taking out 300 uh, enemies in this stage, which is kind of difficult because there are so many boss fights. I want to say it's seven total. And we've already fought one. Can I just say that this stage, this is like an incredible final stage of the game. Oh, here's the second boss, by the way. It's a giant fuck-off cannon. It's just going to keep firing that thing the entire time. Amazing energy output on this ship. I don't know how they do it. Sci-fi space magic. And uh, while we're doing that, we've also got homing bullets coming at us from all directions. Isn't that wonderful? It is wonderful, actually. This is a great final stage. Music's epic. The scenario is out of control insane. And it's just amazing. And not only is it amazing, it also gets anime as fuck. 
right after this boss battle, and that's amazing too. We're beating the second boss, we get a full heal, and that's great because we're done with actual stage. It's nothing but bosses from here on out. Deco and the entire Nebulox are now going to take us on. But they're not the, we're not the only ones that have a final form. So do each of the five Nebulox commanders. First up is Ariana Shami. You might remember her from the uh, Ninja Forest level. And she's a big fan of bullet patterns now. Now, for the uh, medals in the stage, you get one for 300 kills. You get one for doing something special in this particular boss fight, and the rest are obtained by taking no damage in each of the true form Nebulox fights. Which is insanely difficult. I can't do it. In addition to being a fan of bullets, uh, Ariana is also a fan of Asteroids, one of the earliest video games. I was a big fan of it as well. In general, you don't want to destroy the Asteroids because they'll just split and it'll leave more things for you to dodge. But uh, I was very good at asteroids and dodging them, so it's no problem for me. All right, now that we've got her down to half health, we're gonna see a change in pattern. First, some mad flailing and fire, but uh, then we're gonna get some more substantial, way cooler attacks. Got some birds of time, and by destroying all of the portals at once, we receive a medal for that. Still doing pretty good on the taking no damage thing. And this is about where it's going to end. We've got the uh, lightning bolts that also spit bullets out. It's very difficult to tell where exactly the lightning bolt is going to appear based on the distance that Ariana is from the screen. I find this particular pattern extremely difficult to dodge, even though, in theory, there's not as much going on there as there are in other patterns that we'll see. Running low on life, you decided to give Asteroids one more shot, but unfortunately I'm still really good at that game, and it, it does not damage me in the slightest. One thing I like about how we appear on Commander Deco's view screen is uh, that you can still move around while you're on there and keep collecting coins. Make him suffer. All right, our good buddy from the undersea tunnel is up next, Armin Ritter and he appears to have taken a, uh, the form of a prototype of the Imprisoned from Skyward Sword. But uh, unlike the Imprisoned, Armin Ritter is actually a really good and cool boss fight. And it's completely insane! Look at all those feet! All the eyeballs. The eyeballs are firing bullets, by the way, in case you didn't notice, uh, with all of the feet slamming together on screen. His target is the uh, inside of his mouth there. He's got kind of that uvula eyeball thing going on. Now there, when he comes up close, you definitely need to do the full combo against him. Otherwise, he will eat you and you'll take significant damage. When you get him down to around half health, or rather when he completes all of his first attack patterns, uh, we go to Garbage World where he just spits a bunch of crap at you. Uh, you can't hurt him in this form. All you can do is cut through the junk. The key here is to look for the... It's kind of like Red Rover. You need to look for the weak link in the chains of junk and dodge through there. Alternatively, a charge shock to clear it all out. All right. Now we're into the final stage of the fight. This is particularly tough, because what you need to do is take out the eyeballs in order to very temporarily reveal Armored Ritter's weak point. 
Now much like the laser circle of doom earlier on, destroying the eyeballs doesn't actually reduce the number of spotlights on the screen. In fact, it can sometimes increase them as you saw there. Even when you get them down to only one, yes, as you can see, only uh, it only takes one of the eyeballs to put four entire spotlights on the screen. It's kind of insane. We're almost done. Uh, we should be able to get them right after this. Fortunately, it takes just about long enough to kill one of those uh, eyeballs for your charge shot to reload. Ryan Sang turns into something that looks kind of like the, uh, the Aurora unit from Metroid Prime 3, but uh, with these kind of tentacle dealies going on. I don't really like Ryan Sang. I don't think his, his uh, ultimate form is particularly inspired, but it sure does shoot a lot of bullets. The first thing that you're going to want to do is take out each of the links on these chains. That will trigger the ability to send him into the second form once you get enough damage down. It also changes the methods in which the boss can attack you. By destroying them, it takes out some of these lightsaber things and makes it much easier to dodge. You might notice that Orion has a lot less health than the rest of the bosses, despite being in that metallic carrier thing. You'll see why it's important that he has far less health soon enough. Notice that a safe spot forms in this large bullet pattern that you can just follow right up the screen. So it's really easy to dodge that one. Once you get him past 750, he will shell up inside his machine and you'll go to his second form. Here's why it's important that he has so little health. You're now in this full 360 range of motion kind of deal. Uh, depending on where you are in relation to uh, Orion's attack carrier, the attacks he uses against you will be different. Sometimes it's homing bullets, sometimes it's black hole bombs, uh, sometimes tentacles shoot out and grab you like that. And uh, the big problem with this form is that he's only vulnerable during the split seconds that he's out of the carrier and shooting at you. Uh, he'll make brief appearances and not shoot at you sometimes, but you need to keep uh, moving past in front of him to draw him out and get him to shoot you. Because there's so little access to him, to the weak point in this case, it's important that he has low health to compensate for it. Because honestly, eventually your hands will break uh, before you actually have a legitimate shot at killing him if he had the same amount of life as you know, one of the other bosses, like Arion, who had 3,000. I really like Hibaru's transformation because it makes absolutely no sense. None at all. I have no idea why in the world she's suddenly able to split into two ninja samurai things. Puppet kind of deals. You can see the, uh, kind of like marionettes, you can see the strings attached to them. And she somehow creates this... If you play Jez Ball, the old Windows 3.1 game, it kind of looks like you're in a Jez Ball stage. It's actually the second time that Jez Ball's shown up in this game. Maybe somebody at Treasure's a fan. 
So there are two things you need to do. Uh, you want to save your charge shots for when one of them leaves the arena and goes to fire that poison blast. Because there's no real good way to avoid it. And you want to counter the boomerangs and uh, tackles from these guys with your melee attack. You also want to just not get hit by the insane amount of projectiles and poison spew that they put on the screen. This is really a fast and furious fight. Uh, somebody's going to lose it really fast. Neck and neck. And now Deco is stuck fighting us himself. Big words coming from one so anime. But I guess we're not one to talk. <laughs> In giving that monster refuge, your true power emerges. Excellent. I've been anxious to see what you're truly capable of. But you are not the only one who can transform. Now, accept your punishment. So the first time I played this, I could not believe he actually said, You're not the only one who can transform. He is one, this isn't even my final form, away from being just a ridiculous Dragon Ball Z joke in the process. Uh, as it stands, though, he's not a joke in the slightest. This guy will kill you a ton. It is... This fight is fast and furious. You're not going to be able to dodge this stuff forever. It just isn't possible. So what you got to do is just fire off those charge shots, hit with every single one, and dodge each attack to the best of your ability. These homing spheres, for example, uh, will track you around and leave these purple spheres in your path. And while you can avoid them for so long, if you manage to you know, knock them away from you and prevent them from just putting spheres everywhere, he's just going to throw more out. And then he's going to start moving them around like so. What you want to do is keep dodging into safe zones as you see them, or follow along with them as he moves the spheres around. This is another fight where you have full 360 mobility. And it's important to use that whenever you can. Uh, I dodged that attack very poorly, but it's pretty easy to do. You just need slight movements because the knives alternate columns uh, where they exist. Also, you need to watch out that any attack pattern might be augmented by random knives coming from the top or bottom of the screen. These can be knocked away with your melee attack, but they won't actually be knocked back at him. Feeling pretty good about this. He's left me a big safe zone here. And he's going to quickly try to fill it. I'm doing pretty good with the safe zones. Dodging right into them. One of his last attacks is he can absorb all of the purple spheres into himself, but uh, that just creates more patterns for you to dodge and gets them off the screen. There's no payoff to it. Of course, that wasn't even his final form. His final form has 10,000 health, and is fought using a different set of mechanics than the entire rest of the game. Of course, you are batting his projectiles back at him by shooting them. Uh, the red ones set off a chain reaction, and the goal is to stop the projectiles from reaching Kachi's soul, which has been extracted from their combined body and crucified up in space. You can see right there, I finally hit the 300 mark. These green things are an absolute pain. Uh, they split repeatedly and will do a ton of damage if they hit. I'm really trying to get my charge shot 
There we go. Charge shot, charge just in time to prevent disaster. There's a very good chance that you are going to lose to this fight the first couple of times that you get to it, just because it's so different from everything else, and it's not always consistent in how its mechanics are applied. Uh, some shots just go straight at you without giving you a real chance to see where they are. But overall, I, I think it's kind of a neat fight. It's got great music to end things on. The patterns are exactly the same every time you play it. So after enough repetition, eventually you'll get it all down and be able to finally finish the game. And that does it for the set patterns. Where after this, he's just going to start uh, throwing the entire kitchen sink at you from all directions, all the time. And it's just a matter of, can you take him out before you lose? And we can. And with that, the final stage, stage 8, is complete. Please, enjoy, please sit back and enjoy the ending. And that's it. That is Sin and Punishment, Star Successor. I think it's a really fantastic game. Uh, as far as a rail shooter goes, it's a different challenge in every single stage. The escalation of challenges, I think, was done very well. There's just that one weird lull in the middle with the, uh, the highway stage, where I don't feel that it ramps up. It, it goes in kind of a squiggle pattern, instead of just a nice upward curve but you know that's kind of okay too like after the sky base level I can see where you would need a bit of a break before you get to uh, bullet hell and space bullet hell but yeah overall I think there's a real understanding of how to teach the player how to overcome particular challenges in this game they, in, they introduce them, you know, incrementally. They build upon things in each stage. And each stage offers something new that builds upon the last. And it's always different. It's always very cool. And it never gets away from the basic mechanics of the game, even though you do something different every time. Even in the speeder stage, where the mechanics of movement are different than everything else, everything you've learned up to then still applies. You're still, you know, hitting things back at other things and dodging as normal. And I like that even, you know, as they're trying to make a really challenging game, they always think about, you know, what to do to make it fun for the player. I think, philosophically, these guys are a lot like Platinum, where they want you to do stuff that just seems really cool and really fun. So if you've played Bayonetta or Wonderful 101, you can probably tell what I mean. You, like, the stuff you do just looks really cool, and it feels really cool when you're doing it. And sometimes, you know, something's in there, something's put in there, it's not really difficult, it's just fun or cool, like the dinosaur baseball part from uh, the volcano stage. Overall, it's just a really well put together game. And there's even more stuff to do, too. You know, you can play as Kachi with the alternate firing patterns. Uh, and there's a hard mode. I believe once you defeat or uh, beat the game on hard mode with both characters, you also unlock a mode where you can play as both Isa and Kachi at the same time, and just switch between them at the touch of a button, which is really cool. Although, I kind of wish that was in there from the start. It seems like a weird thing to have to unlock. Overall though, I mean, if you have the ability to play this game, what are you even doing watching me play this game? You should go play it yourself, it's amazing. 
really enjoy it. I'm kind of disappointed that Issa and Kachi never made it into Smash Brothers, actually. They'd make a nice Ice Climbers replacement. Especially if you use the uh, Issa and Kachi mode from this game, so you just press a button to switch. I guess they got rid of all the transformation characters, though. That's kind of a shame. No, really, you should you should play this game. It, in, ca in case I haven't been perfectly clear, you should do that. That'll wrap it up for Let's Play Sin and Punishment Star Successor. But uh, after the credits, please stay, because much like a Marvel movie, there uh, I left something at the end. Something that we haven't seen at all in this playthrough. Something that, when it happened, got me this close to flinging my controller at a wall. Damn it.